Hey, this is Jesse with Create This. Today I'm going to talk about the building of the battery bomb, as I lovingly call it. So this is a 1,200 watt hour solar generator. Uh, it has a 2,000 watt inverter inside and a, that's a Xantrex inverter, and it's got a 1,200 watt hour LifePo4 battery. As you can see, I, I charge it up with an array of uh, four 100 watt monocrystalline solar panels out on the back deck here. All right, here's a video of the solar generator outside of its uh, Pelican case, and it's next to a window air conditioner. So let's talk design criteria. One of the primary design criteria that I had for this solar generator was I wanted to be able to run a window air conditioner, just a small one. Uh, I think this one is 8,000 BTU, and it does this quite well. I also wanted to be able to run, uh, or to charge rather, most of my large batteries like my uh, Greenworks cordless uh, electric lawnmower battery, my camera batteries, my boosted board battery, my Bosch e-bike battery, and my laptops. And it also does that quite well. My third criteria was I really wanted to be able to run uh, heavy power tools like a table saw with the solar generator. It turns out that it's not capable of doing that because of the high inrush current associated with starting those sorts of motors. I have another video about that that I will link down below in the description. All right, so why do I call this thing a battery bomb? Well, before we get into the build details too much, let's, let's talk about this. So I'm not an electrical engineer, and uh, electrical engineers, when they build products like this, they build in uh, efficiency margins and you know heat dissipation and safety margins and things like that that I just absolutely did not include because I'm not uh, trained to, to know even what those safety margins are in most cases. So uh, here we can see a thermal image of the battery bomb from the front on a tripod and you can see glowing red. I've got a cell phone, I've got a cell phone charger, and then in the back and in the front I've got the Midnight Classic body and the Midnight Classic charge controller faceplate in the front. And here I am picking up a cell phone and, and moving it to the side a little bit there. So, uh, you know, we can see that the Midnight Classic gets quite hot and it is quite close to the LIFO4 battery. The LIFO4 battery is just right in front of it inside the case. And there's not a whole lot of cooling uh, av available there. There's a little fan on top, but it's not very strong. Here's another clip taken with a Thermap uh, Hertz model, and uh, I've got the temperature display on here. So you can see that the, you know, this temperature display isn't too, too accurate, but you can see that the Midnight Classic is 82 degrees. Uh, that's a MacBook Pro charging wart, and, you know, the MacBook itself is 70 degrees. So not incredibly hot, but again, I'm, I'm going with low voltages and low amperages right now in this, in this video. We're only charging a MacBook Pro from the inverter and charging a, an iPhone 7 Plus from the DC power supply. Uh, if we look inside, that glowing thing inside that hole there is the inverter on the very bottom, and you can see that it's fairly warm. So if we were running something like, say, a window air conditioner that pulls 700 watts instead of uh, you know the 100 or 150 watts that we're pulling right now, this would be much hotter. So this is 75 degrees for the uh, inverter in there. We can see the side of the Midnight Classic here through this porthole. You can see that that's the, the bottom of it. And right beside it there, that's the battery. That's the LifePo 4 battery right there. So you can see, uh, you know, it, it, if we were pulling in a lot of charging power, if we were charging more than 400 watts or even just 400 watts, uh, the Midnight Classic could get quite warm and that could cause problems for the battery. Um, the inverter can get warm when we're discharging. The wiring could even get warm. I might have, I might have screwed up and there might be too much heat in the wiring. So uh, that, that's why I call this a battery bomb because I am not an expert and I'm just a hobbyist and I'm just screwing around here. All right, if you're still with me, on with the build. So here's the Pelican 350 case, and I am, uh, this is some of the foam that came with it, and I'm just, you know, it's an interference fit there, so I'm fitting it in there to see how it fits and pulling it back out again. I used, I ended up using this as a template for uh, a lot of things. And here is my, some of my initial layout work. You can see I've got a uh, bus bar on the right there under my knee, 
and uh, the LVD is the blue thing at the top, the Xantrex inverter is right in the middle, and the Midnight Classic is on the left, and the Victron is on the left. I originally planned on putting all of this stuff above the plywood level, uh, so that it had easy access to the air, but I ended up deciding that I preferred to have all of my controls above the plywood level, and so I rearranged things to put things down below the case more. And that's, again, going to cause more thermal problems, so maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Maybe it was. I don't know. Here you can see the top plate that I used in the previous iteration of the solar generator. You can see that it's not a solid piece of plywood. It's actually built up. And in the background there, you can see the template that I drew, or that I had Isaac draw, uh, from the piece of foam. And I think I'm going to pull the foam up here and put it on the template and show you. So you can see I just traced around this foam, and that's how I got my template. Next, we cut this large piece of plywood in half with a table saw so that we could more easily cut the template piece out with a jigsaw. And here, Isaac and I are cutting out the template from the piece of plywood with a jigsaw. I don't have a belt sander, so here I am planing off the sides of the template with my 12-inch jointer. I don't really recommend this. It didn't give the best finish. Next, I jointed, planed, and ripped some 2x4s to provide the supports for the outer cage. Here I am using a Festool Domino to uh, install loose tenon joinery for the outer cage. More domino work here. I, I enjoy using the domino. I think it does a great job and it makes great joints. Quick demo of how these dominoes fit together in real time. And this is one of the initial test fits of the frame inside the Pelican case. You can see that it's uh, designed to fit it pretty snugly, and I've rounded off the corners with a router to make it fit properly. And this is one of the early battery placements and supports. I spent a lot of time with it up on the bench, you know, tinkering around, just trying to figure out where I wanted everything. And here's a nice time lapse of the glue up. You have to work pretty quickly. I'm working on top of a welding table that I built, so that way nothing sticks. And I'm using a plethora of clamps. I ended up reinforcing everything with some angle brackets and screws to support the additional weight. And this gives you an idea how the lid fits on. I spent a bunch of time at this point trying to decide how I wanted everything laid out on the top, and I decided eventually that I preferred to have all of the UI components, like knobs and switches and dials and displays on top, rather than having the uh, actual components themselves, like LVDs and inverters and uh, charge controllers on top. And so here I am uh, toying with the idea of putting everything inside the case uh, as far as the bulky components go along with the battery and putting the UI components on top. So UI component design was a bit of a challenge, the, the layout work here, because I didn't actually own a lot of these components or I hadn't disassembled the parts yet so I didn't have access to them or they weren't flat, so they just weren't easy to lay out. So what I did is I measured uh, from the schematics online for the components that I didn't have, and I created little cardboard cutouts of them. And so here I'm pointing at the um, Blue Sea Systems uh, DC circuit breakers. And you know I just used those cardboard cutouts to move everything around and lay them out how I wanted. And that actually worked really well. I, I highly recommend doing this uh, yourself if you're interested in doing a project like this. Uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility. You don't have to cut more than once, and you get to kind of get a visual representation of where everything is going to be before you actually do any real work. All right, so this is uh, one of the initial internal layouts. I installed a tray underneath that, uh, that top level there. And I mounted my Blue Sea Systems uh, 600 amp bus bars there. And uh, I'm toying with the location of the blue LVD in the background there and the DC shunt for the Victron uh, state of charge meter in the foreground and the Blue Sea Systems bus bars. They didn't end up being in exactly these locations, but uh, this gives you an idea how I figured out where I would put them eventually. 
And so the, the name of the game here was, you know, I'm using these really huge 4 aught cables. So I was just trying to lay everything out so that I could use the shortest cable runs possible. And uh, this was very helpful. I, I spent a lot of time doing this. And here we're just checking the layout with the lid on. And I would look underneath and see if the cable runs were appropriate or not. This is just another view from the front, and you can see the inverter uh, tentatively installed to the right of the battery, and I've still got my Victron shunt uh, in the foreground there. It ended up not being there permanently, I don't think. Here I am cutting out uh, holes for the Blue Sea Systems DC breakers on the top plate using a Forstner bit on the drill press. I think I had most of the holes cut at this point, but I didn't yet have all of the Blue Sea Systems breakers in from shipping yet. So, uh, and then this just shows how the top plate goes on these studs. Moving right along, we have more components mounted. We've got the switch for the inverter in the middle there, the Victron power meter, the Midnight Classic uh, front control panel, uh, a few Anderson plugs installed and my DC 12 volt uh, full amp pass-throughs. There's, there's one on the left there with the black and then in the upper right there's a red one. And this is a pretty good representation of the final layout inside that top tray. So this is where all the wiring goes. Uh, we've got the Victron shunt in the middle front. We've got uh, two more pass-throughs. I'm showing off my, my brand new uh, M18 Milwaukee drill and driver. I really love these things. Uh, but we've got two pass-throughs in the front there for the inverter. And uh, the LVD is in the upper right there. And if I remember correctly, I believe this is the way that I ended up keeping it. So this is the, the final layout. Here I'm showing off uh, the copper bar that I used for um, bus bar to connect the inverter down below with the pass-throughs. And I have another video, I'll link to it down below in the description, uh, that describes how I made those bus bars in more detail. Here I have the bus bar installed on the negative terminal of the inverter. Um, kind of weird. I, it looks like when I filmed this, I didn't realize that I used a red uh, panel pass-through or bulkhead pass-through up there at the top with a negative terminal. I'm pretty sure I fixed that later on, though. And here you can get an idea of the size of the 4 rod cable inside there. Um, they are really, really large and stiff, so you have to spend a lot of time and care making sure that everything fits properly. Uh, I have another video about how I crimped the ends on these cables uh, and again contributing to the whole battery bomb thing. Uh, there's no guarantee that those crimps will hold. They could break loose at some point in time because I didn't use certified uh, crimp tools and I probably didn't even use the correct connector ends. So there's that. But it seems to be working fine for now. And here's a, just a demonstration of the master breaker turning on. It's a 150 amp DC breaker. And that is currently the, uh, the other DC breakers in this video are not hooked up, but that is uh, turning on the Midnight Classic and energizing everything. Uh, and it gives you an idea of what the panel layout looks like. Those D rings that you see on the left and the right are uh, used to lift it up with an engine crane because the, the damn thing is so heavy. Um, I guess one of my other design criteria was originally to have this be a fairly light build, but uh, I failed miserably. <laughs> it's so heavy it takes two people to lift. So um, anyway, that's pretty much it. I, I hope you found this video interesting or useful. If you did, go ahead and leave me a like down below and uh, check out the description down below as well. I have a lot of uh, the components that I use in this build listed there. You can check them out if you're interested in buying some of the same or you want to see how much they cost or whatever. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave those down below. As always, thanks for watching and please subscribe.